Hi, welcome to the Daily Aviation Channel. I'm Mark, and this weird-looking plane is the Super Guppy. You might think it's not the most stylish plane, it's true, but it is a very efficient aircraft for carrying bulky cargo. It was one of the most important elements for the U.S. space conquest and for the birth of the giant Airbus Aerospace. Built in the 1960s on the basis of a Boeing 377 for the pregnant Guppy, then on the basis of the C-97 Stratocruisers for the Super Guppy, it was the first aircraft of its kind to be serviced and would inspire the design of similar planes such as the Airbus Beluga or the Boeing Dreamlifter several decades later. The Guppy story is closely linked to the American space conquest. In the 1960s, the United States and the USSR had embarked on a frantic race to get to space first. The rockets used to get into space became bigger and bigger and more complicated to build. At that time, the stages of Saturn rockets, indispensable tools of the conquest of the moon, were cylinders more than 10 meters long and more than 5 meters in diameter. Built in California, they were sent to Cape Canaveral, Florida, where rockets were launched. Road or rail transport was impossible, and the largest cargo plane available at the time was far from having the necessary volume. NASA's rocket stages had to be loaded onto a barge and shipped by sea via the Panama Canal. This 15-day trip took place under the constant supervision of five engineers who had a hard time preventing certain parts from getting deformed or corroded after this long sea voyage. The goal of these engineers was to prevent anything that might lead to the destruction of the rocket during its launch. Jack Conroy, a former U.S. Air Force pilot and Lee Mansdorf, a broker buying and selling airplanes whose airlines no longer had utility, quickly realized that NASA would need a new type of aircraft to carry its rockets. Their idea? Build a cargo plane large enough to safely ship in less than 24 hours the future NASA rockets from one end of the U.S. to the other. The two men created Aero Space Lines Incorporated in 1960. At that time, the airlines were getting rid of their old Boeing 377 Stratocruiser, which became obsolete by the arrival of much more powerful jet aircraft, such as the Boeing 707. The Boeing 377 was a poorly designed, very complex, and expensive aircraft. It would experience several serious accidents during its short career. At first glance, it did not seem to be the ideal aircraft to carry the fragile NASA rockets. But Jack Conroy and Lee Mansdorf still decided to use the base of a former Pan Am Boeing 377 for the production of their future aircraft. This choice was probably motivated by the fact that Lee Mansdorf had previously purchased a substantial stock of B-377s as part of his aircraft brokerage business. The first pregnant guppy came out of the Aerospace Lines workshops in 1962. The fuselage was initially lengthened by 5 meters. And after only two flight tests, a new fuselage of 9.5 meters in diameter was built on the old one. The pregnant guppy was born. This new aircraft was not really handsome, and its weird shapes for the time made it quite challenging to fly. Its loading procedure was even more special since the plane had to be literally split in two before being able to load the cargo. Yet the plane would become a success, according to NASA, who would succeed, thanks to the Guppy, to carry its rocket parts across the country in less than 18 hours, against the more than two weeks with the trip by sea. But even before the first pregnant Guppy flight, it was apparent that NASA would need a larger aircraft intended for the transport of its new Saturn V rockets that were too big for the current plane. Since the pregnant guppy was no longer doing the job, a decision was made to use the basis of a Boeing C-97 Stratofreighter to create a new aircraft. The future device would keep the appearance of the pregnant guppy, but with much greater abilities. Built with a pressurized cabin and more powerful engines, it would be equipped with a larger fuselage, and unlike its predecessor, cargo would be loaded not from behind, but in through the front, with a nose section that opened up to 110 degrees. 
The plane made its first flight in 1965 and would be put into service in 1966. The decision was made to call it Super Guppy. At that time, the Super Guppy was five times bigger than any commercial aircraft in service. Here again, the plane is a success for NASA. It will succeed to deliver in time its Saturn V rockets and other components of the Apollo program. This plane was an integral part of NASA's history, such that NASA would say some years later that they would not have been able to send a man to the moon in 1969 without the help of the guppy. A legend is born. After successfully carrying boosters and other components during the space race, it was the turn of Airbus industry to take an interest in the Super Guppy. In the 70s, the Airbus industry launched its ambitious A300 program, gathering several countries of Europe and whose goal was to compete with the American aircraft manufacturers like Boeing or McDonnell Douglas. The European aircraft manufacturer wanted to route its fuselage sections quickly from the four corners of Europe to Toulouse. Toulouse being the assembly center of Airbus in the south of France. The A300 was the very first Airbus plane, and after a difficult start, the program became a big commercial success. Since its creation, more than 560 A300s have been sold, and many are still active in service in various countries around the world. In the 1970s, however, Airbus faced the same difficulties in transporting its fuselage parts as NASA did for its rockets. Road transport was far too slow and challenging for the A300 parts. Realizing that the Super Guppy would be the solution to the transport of fuselage or wing sections between its various European factories and the Toulouse assembly line, Airbus industry decided to place an order for two guppies. Here again, the success was remarkable for the Super Guppy. The sections of aircraft are delivered in record time, eliminating at the same time much of the storage needs of the aircraft manufacturer. Airbus would be so pleased with the services rendered by the aircraft that it would order two additional models. They even needed to abandon the unique model of Pregnant Guppy to complete the fourth copy for Airbus. Airbus would attempt to obtain a fifth aircraft, but the Super Guppy was getting older, and more and more difficult to maintain. Spare parts became hard to find, and aircraft maintenance costs took off. The idea of buying a new aircraft would be abandoned, and after 26 years of service and more than 47,000 hours of flying, Airbus would abandon its Super Guppy in favor of a larger and more modern aircraft, the Airbus Beluga. Based on the Airbus A300, the Beluga would enter service within Airbus's private fleet in 1995 and would quickly perform better than the Super Guppy, especially in terms of load carrying capacity, which is two times higher on the Beluga, but also in terms of maintenance cost. Unlike the Guppy, the Beluga is equipped with a modern engine, and finding spare parts is no longer a problem since Airbus itself is the producer of the Beluga, meaning it has unlimited access to these parts. Today, only one Super Guppy remains that is able to fly. Purchased by NASA in 1997, it is used to transport the agency's large elements such as components of the International Space Station or other equipment such as NASA's T-38 training jets that you can see here during a loading operation. In order to perform this loading, the front section of the Super Guppy is opened first. The opening speed is slow enough not to damage the aircraft body. The T-38 jets are then gently introduced into the cargo compartment. The crew must be cautious not to touch the edge of the plane cabin during this operation. Once loading is complete, the Super Guppy can now take off. The weight of the cargo and the unique shape of the plane make the takeoff quite delicate. The crew of three people, two pilots and one flight engineer, must pay attention to the crosswind that could destabilize the aircraft. The landing is also unusual since the plane must touch the ground with its front gear first, and then with its rear gear, 
yet another peculiarity for an aircraft already out of the ordinary. You've reached the end of this video. I hope you liked it. If you haven't done it yet, please don't hesitate to subscribe to my YouTube channel. It's free. You can also watch my other videos, and if you like my work, you can support me on Patreon to help me produce more content. Thanks, and stay tuned to the next video.